Let us have a word for illumination before we read. God, give us wisdom, give us insight, give us a love for your word as you teach us your ways and help us to live by your commands. Thank you for your spirit that inspired its writing and now its reading and our hearing and then our applying it to the glory of Christ our Lord. Amen. So join me in reading God's promise after the flood. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as it came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood. And never again there shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The word of the Lord. Hear now God's word from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. Christ suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The word of the Lord. Well, I trust you know about leprechauns and their pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, right? Just find the end of the rainbow, you find the pot of gold? Easy. <laughs> except you can't ever find the end of the rainbow. You move and the rainbow moves with you. No one ever finds the leprechaun's gold because nobody could ever find the end of the rainbow, but we love rainbows nonetheless. We, we love songs about rainbows, whether it's that great theologian and philosopher, Kermit the Frog, singing why there's so many songs about rainbows and what's on the other side, Rainbows are visions, they're only illusions, and rainbows have nothing to hide. Someday we'll find it, the rainbow connection, the lovers, the dreamers, and me. But of course, Judy Garland, somewhere over the rainbow. Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, there's a land that I heard of once in a lullaby. Someday I'll wish upon a star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me where troubles melt like lemon drops and above the chimney chops, that's where you'll find me. Of course, just saying the lyrics, there's nothing like singing them, is it? And talking about rainbows, there's nothing like seeing one. But Kermit and Judy Garland both remind us that rainbows remind us whatever the situation we're going through, it's not permanent. And we'll find happiness somewhere over the rainbow where bluebirds fly. Once in children's church, Sunday school, knowing that they had studied Noah's Ark in Sunday school, I asked them during the children's sermon, why is the rainbow up in the sky? And Doug, who was bright beyond his years, shut us, and I rarely called on Doug if I could help it. 
But nobody else raised their hand. I finally said, okay, Doug, why is the rainbow up in the sky? And I realized he's about six or seven years old because sunlight refracting through water creates a prism effect. (laughs) The congregation did the same thing. And then they looked at me like, yes. (laughs) And I thought, yeah, you're right. It's not what I was looking for, but yes. I mean, there is a scientific explanation for rainbows, but who cares? We love the joy, the beauty, the mystery of it. We love the sign, the promise. Because do you ever look at a rainbow and not think of Noah's Ark? We take photographs of them. We sing about them. We stop and take a picture. We stop the car and look at them. Everybody loves a rainbow, and children know the story of Noah's Ark. Many a Sunday school room are decorated with banners, murals, models of Noah and the Ark, and all the animals you can move around. We presented Noah and the animals are almost like on a houseboat until the rains come, and then there's a flood, and then the rainbow appears, and it's an all-clear sign, and the signal is that the flood is over and it's safe to go outside, but... You know, it's really a violent story. We don't tell the rest of the story. God despairs of his people's sinfulness, and he decides to wipe them out and start over. In Genesis chapter 6, the Lord saw the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth and that every inclination in the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. God is disappointed, God's discouraged, and he says, I'm sorry I made them. Boy, that's sobering, isn't it? I'm sorry I made them. And then Genesis 7 tells us that God decided to start over, and in anger and with some regret, he sent the rains for 40 days and 40 nights and wiped out everything except Noah and his wife and their three boys and their three wives and the animals they brought into the ark. Everything else is gone. So why did God choose Noah? He was the only righteous man left in the world, it says. So he's going to honor his righteousness and his family so they can have a generation to start afresh. But after the water subsided and he leaves the ark, what does Noah do? Do you remember? He gets drunk. And after who knows what all, he passes out naked in his tent. And his boys back in avert their eyes and they cover, it says, their father's shame with a blanket. So this righteous man, maybe not so righteous after all. But Noah's story is our story. That's the dark side of this Noah story. We pass over that part. It's the side of the story we consider as we begin this 40-day Lenten journey. This is the season to confront the sin in the world and our own sin. Have we done anything that would make God want to start over? Corruption is still rampant in our world. Violence is still rampant in our world. Injustice is still rampant in our world. Racism, xenophobia, all these things are still rampant in our world. Crime is still rampant. Greed, selfishness, murder. We still treat people poorly. We still trample societies and we still trample the earth. How and when are we ever going to get our act together and start living together as a world so that everyone may flourish under God's promise? Though the story seems at first a story of God's impatience, God's disappointment, we may also see this as a sign of God's determination to restore harmony in the world and to bring us back to what God had intended when he created us. Consider what Peter says about Noah in that second passage. Peter looked at it quite differently. 
1 Peter 3.20, God waited patiently in the days of Noah, patiently, as the ark was being built. Patiently for what? That people might come to their realization and repent of their sins? Maybe this crazy man building a giant boat where there's no water might prompt them to get right with God? Maybe as the flood water started to rise, people would start to repent. Peter says the Noah story reminds us that we have been saved by God's wrath, by God's sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and that the waters of our baptism remind us of the waters of Noah and the people being washed in the River Jordan and as they went to the waters of the Red Sea and all those waters, images about God's grace for us rather than God's wrath for us. And baptism is to remind us, Peter says, it serves as an appeal to God for us to have a clear conscience made clean by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. May we not forfeit what you have done for us in the waters, O God, and may this baptism remind us of your grace upon us. And after the waters receded, God looks at the destruction and he regrets what he has done. And he promises the water will never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. It's, it's as if God is repenting of his own impatience. God is regretting what he had to do. And so he sets the rainbow in the sky and says to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and you and all flesh for all time. And he repeats it three times. What captivates the children in the story is not just the boat and the animals and the talent show and all the sounds we can make. It's also the rainbow in the sky. Children, all of God's children, love a rainbow. And some words in the Bible are so strong, so beautiful and perfect, you just can't help but know they came from God, from the lips of God. Grace, love, forgiveness. Add to that list, covenant. This is my promise to you. And it's not even a two-sided contract. This is what I promise to do for you. It's a strong word. It's, it's a good word. It's, it's a godly word. God, one side it says, here's what I'm going to do for you. My grace is upon you. Never again destroy. And so God brings hope again when just a few chapters later, God calls Abraham out of his father's house to begin a new nation of people who will belong solely to God. And that's his promise to Abraham. I will establish you as the father of the children and the nation, my people. And then Abraham's son Isaac begets the angry Esau and the scheming Jacob and everything goes bad again. And then 400 years of slavery in Egypt and God's people are liberated by the murderer, Moses. And despite Moses bringing down God's Ten Commandments, Israel continues to sin against their God. How slow are we to learn? Things, have they really gotten better? Has humanity really changed? That's, that's the guts of this story. And yet God remains faithful in his, cov his covenant with us, extending forgiveness and hope that we may yet get our act together and in faithful obedience to God and goodness toward others, live out this covenant as he intends. He's, he's a covenant-making God. He renews his covenant. Over the next few Sundays, we're going to look at God's covenant with all of humanity and the hope that we gain when we trust in God's covenant. The first covenant with Noah related to the building and entering the ark. The second covenant was to all creatures all over the earth with a rainbow in the sky. The next covenant he makes with Abraham in Genesis 17. Then the next covenant is with the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai. And then he covenants with Israel after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, just before entering the promised land, what he will do and how it will go well. And then they pass through the waters of the Jordan into the promised land. 
And then we know that God renews his covenant in Jesus Christ who says, this is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins of the whole world. In every case, whether it's Noah or Jacob or, or King David or the prophets or any of the other colorful and sinful characters that fill the pages of the Old Testament, we hear God say over and over, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. I establish, I maintain, I uphold my covenant. This is who I am and what I'm doing for you. And though we don't deserve it, God remains faithful to us. Because if you read carefully, it says the rainbow is there to remind God, not us. Did you read that? In that story, verses 15 and 16, it may surprise the rainbow is not in the sky to remind Noah, but remind God. It's there to jog God's memory so that every time God looks down upon us, he's reminded of his promise that his grace will override his judgment and his wrath. So a seminary professor of mine remarked that the rainbow is in the shape of an old-fashioned bow, a bow and arrow when strung, a long bow. And he says, I hang up my bow in the heavens as if he's not going to use it anymore. Not an instrument of destruction, but an instrument of protection and deliverance. The bow is hung up in the sky. And then he reminds us that the bow and the arc of the rainbow is reminiscent of the ark of the tent, the canopy under which the Jews made their vows. So all of creation, all of humanity is under the bow of God's covenant and God's promise to us. His presence and His faithfulness to us overrides everything under the canopy. And that is God's promise and God's faithfulness to you and to all of us. Do you ever see a rainbow that you don't think of Noah's Ark? Take comfort in God's promise to us. It's the bow of the promise of the protection of God and the canopy of His covenant. So we're now in the season of Lent, and we're going to be considering just how far will go, God will go to keep His covenant. This is the season when words like grace and love and forgiveness and covenant all come together to point us to Jesus who is the full and final embodiment of God's covenant and grace. And God waited patiently for us to come around. And then he sent his son. That's, that's all the covenant we need. So in this Lenten season, give thanks to God and his eternal patience that he loves you that much. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Put your name in the verse. For God so loved you. Do you know the name Jürgen Moltmann? At the age of 18, a young German man named Jürgen Moltmann was drafted into Hitler's army and he was taken captive by Allied soldiers, and he was sent to a prisoner of war camp in Scotland. And there, for the first time, he saw pictures of the concentration camps run by the Nazis. And his eyes were open. They said his conscience was overflowing. He saw undeniable proof of the overwhelming evil that he had been supporting. And as a result, he had terrible shame, self-hatred, great depression. And then visiting chaplains gave Jürgen a Bible. And he read about God who loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for us, to die on the cross to take away our sins. And in 1947, Jürgen Moltmann was invited to attend a Christian conference where he received forgiveness from Dutch Christians who had survived the concentration camps. He was so inspired and moved by their forgiveness that he became a Christian. And this young man, Jürgen Moltmann, went on to become one of the great influential Christian theologians of the 20th century, writing books that have influenced a generation of pastors. 
He was especially known for his theology of hope. Hope. Hope in God, help, hope in Christ, hope in the help of the Holy Spirit. In one of his books he wrote, but the ultimate reason for our hope is not to be found in what we want, what we wish for, what we wait for. The ultimate reason is that we are wanted and wished for and waited for. For God is our last hope because we are God's first love. We are God's first love. God, the creator of all life, the source of all that is good, God loves you that much. His word for you. He created you in his image. He breathed his life into you. He made you to be a special focus of his love. And despite his disappointment at humanity's sinfulness, God is hopelessly, passionately in love with you. God saved you by sacrificing his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross, that you may be free from sin and able to live for God in grace and mercy and peace. The rainbow and the empty cross reminds you that God has not forgotten you, has not failed you, has not forfeited the grace he put upon you. And whenever the waters flood you or threaten to overwhelm you, God is with you to deliver you. He has made covenant with you, and his covenant cannot fail. Thanks be to God. Amen? His covenant cannot fail, and he will sustain you in everything to the glory of Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. God, it's all that easy, isn't it? But it's all so hard to believe. Forgive us then and renew your covenant in us. Thank you for being patient and long-suffering with us. Make covenant again with us, Lord. And may that covenant lead us into your kingdom. I ask it in his name.